we are here on Gadigal land, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. It's my pleasure to be here today to launch the third uh, Being Chinese in Australia poll. It's, the, it's a public opinion uh, survey of Chinese communities and their attitudes uh, to the world and to Australia. This project was developed and written by my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Su, the Lowy Institute's Director of Multi Multiculturalism, Identity and Influence Project. Fieldwork for the project took place uh, between September and December 2022. It's a nationally representative survey uh, a sample of 1,200 people who self-identified as having Chinese heritage. Now, there are 1.4 million people with Chinese ancestry living in Australia. That represents about 5.5% of the total population. The context over the existence of this survey for the last three years has, of course, been a turbulent one. We've seen the, the COVID-19 pandemic and varying restrictions in both Australia and China. We've seen a deterioration in the Australia-China relationship and a recent thaw in relations. Foreign interference laws have been implemented in Australia. Geopolitical tensions in the region have been on the rise and public awareness of media, disinformation and data privacy have increased. Against this backdrop, this poll asks Australia, uh, Chinese Australians about three broad themes. How do Chinese Australians see Australia and their place in it? How do they consume news and information? And how do, how do they view the wider world? My panelists today are uh, on my left, Dr. Jennifer Su, author of the report. Jennifer obtained her PhD in development studies at Cambridge University. She's, a, she's, as I said before, the Lowy Institute's Multiculturalism, Identity and Influence Project Director and a Senior Visiting Fellow at the UNSW's Social Policy and Research Centre. Samuel Yang is the host of ABC TV's China Tonight. He has previously worked as a business reporter uh, in Sydney and Melbourne. Sam was nominated for Young Journalist of the Year in 2020 and is the winner of the Premier's Multicultural Communications Public Interest Award. And Lucy Du uh, is the CEO of the Australia-China Young Professionals Initiative. She's also the head of community at a global private investment firm and was previously uh, the manager of public diplomacy at the Australian Consulate in Shanghai. All of our panelists tonight have Chinese heritage and I'll ask them to speak briefly to that in a moment. But before I do, I'd like to open the discussion uh, with Jennifer Su. Jennifer, congratulations on this report, uh, this, this uh, interesting piece of work and contribution to the national debate. I'd like to ask you why this project started, why it exists, and what you think it adds to the national conversation. Good, good evening, everyone. Really delighted to see you all here. Um, the genesis of the research project is cast your mind back to, say, six or seven years ago when the foreign interference debate was... Um, red and hot. Um, there were a lot of discussions, but a lot of anecdotes as well. And so the genesis of the project, would, I would have to attribute that to Natasha Kassam, my former colleague. Um, and the aim of the project is really to insert data points into the debate. And it is our hope that the survey report of the last three years allows us to do that. Um, surveying the sentiments of Chinese Australians on a range of issues which Ryan has mentioned. And I just want to acknowledge um, that this is a collective effort and I want to say thank you to my colleagues, Claire, Ian, Anthony, Sam, um, and everyone here at the Lowy Institute for making this report happen. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and can you also tell us a bit about who you polled and the thinking behind that? So um, we surveyed 1,200 people of Chinese ancestry who self-identify, but also based on um, Australian Bureau of Statistics census data based on country of birth, um, first and second ancestry, parents' country of birth as well. Um, on the one of the key themes of this report on identity and belonging, there's, it's clear that there is a growing sense of belonging in the Chinese Australian community. Uh, uh, the three quarters in, in most recent report felt a great or moderate sense of belonging 
to Australia, which is an increase in 11 points from 2021. Uh, a smaller majority, 66%, report a sense of belonging to the Chinese people, and a, and a bare majority report a sense of belonging to China. Now, obviously, there's an overlap between uh, people's uh, sense of belonging to different groups and how they identify. I think it'd be good to start with uh, uh, asking each panelist to, to say how you uh, describe yourself, um, what does Chinese identity mean to you, and where do you feel you belong? Um, Samuel, can I start with you? Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I identify identify myself as a Chinese Australian, but that hasn't always been the case um, because when I first came here as an international student, I was more of a Chinese, um, but when I became an Australian citizen, I feel very proud of that and also identify myself as a Chinese Australian. I think um, the citizenship would gave me, um, it actually gave me the sense of belonging to this country, to the society, and to the especially to the Chinese Australian community. That's why um, I identify myself in this way. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Yeah, the, this question about identity is one that always gets people talking, and um, I feel like this is a question that we can go over many times. And identity is a fluid thing. I would say for me, I, it's complicated. It's always complicated. I, I mean, to keep it brief, I'd say I'm Chinese, Taiwanese, Australian, living in Sydney. Um, I love Sydney, and I think that's a marker of who I am. And the last one, not least, Lucy. Lucy, oh, too. I think I feel very similar sentiments. Um, hi, everybody, and it's great to be here. It's so nice to see so many people um, being a part of this conversation. I think my identity changes on almost a daily basis based on what I do, who I'm talking to, um, how I feel about the current state of affairs between Australia and China. Um, I was born in China. I came here when I was five. Um, so I think I have a pretty unique upbringing. My parents uh, and I moved to an area in Melbourne which is very multicultural but not Chinese. So I was probably the only Asian at school. Um, and some of you might know my story that I begged my parents to pack me ham and cheese sandwiches to school. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, I grew up um, speaking Chinese at home, really, you know, being very connected and having very traditional parents. So that kind of, for me growing up, it was in the 90s, being Australian was probably very important. Um, and I didn't know enough about my heritage to really say that I'm Chinese. And it wasn't until I moved to Shanghai in 2014, um, learned a lot more about my culture, about my ancestry, um, improved my language skills, that um, I think, you know, for myself, I feel a lot more comfortable identifying as Chinese Australian and being Asian Australian, um, and also reflecting in the last probably five years in Australia, there's a lot more advocacy um, and empowering of Asian Australians. And I think, you know, overall, I see not just myself, but with others, um, a bit more confidence in identifying um, being Australian, but in a Chinese context. Interesting. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, on the issue of racism, uh, this has come up in previous years in the poll. What we've actually seen is, uh, is a downward trend this year. Fewer Chinese Australians reported being called offensive names or being physically threatened or attacked because of their heritage uh, than previous years. Uh, Jennifer Su, do you see a link between the rising sense of belonging and decreasing incidences of racism or reported incidences of racism? Yeah, so I think this is a, um, a positive finding that it has decreased. Um, in the past year. And part of this, I think we can sort of bring the broader context, the national context and sort of the broad, broader regional context. First is that over the past year, we in Australia have moved away from um, COVID lockdowns in a, I guess what you could say fairly ordered manner. Um, but at the same time elsewhere, i.e. China, there was, um, you know, uh, still continuing lockdowns. So as, as Australia opened up, as greater mobility was allowed for us to move in between states, 
between suburbs, um, there was a greater sense of connection um, to place, to your community, um, and also allowing um, freedom to travel, to see friends, family, allowed us, and I think this is one of the things that, um, that came up in our focus groups um, this past year with Chinese Australians, is that, that sense of um, being able to reconnect with nation, with state, with community, um, having gone through lockdown. So I think those things um, have probably gives context to this statistic, um, but it's still a, a one that we should be working towards lowering. Thank you. And on that, Samuel Yang, could I ask, do you see this reflecting the Australian community writ large being uh, more tolerant? Um, I actually feel so happy to see this finding because um, during the pandemic, I've done I think I've done way too many stories about racism or people reported they've been targeted um, during the pandemic, especially at the height of the pandemic um, in 2020, the ABC did, an, uh, did a national, national investigation looking to um, the COVID-related racism and we received, I was part of that project and we, we received hundreds of responses from our readers across the country uh, saying that they have either witnessed or experienced racism um, against the, the Chinese Australian or the Asian community. Um, I think a sense of belonging is so important, especially when it comes to migrants or the migrant community. And this is our new home and we need to feel that we are safe to be here. We, we have a role to play. And um, I think it, this, yeah, so I think this finding is, uh, the new findings uh, is fabulous. And uh, so, <coughs> so, so happy to see people are feeling more um, belong to Australia. Can I ask a question? Yeah, Even though I should be answering your questions. Um, just people in the room, I'm curious. Um, how would you answer the question as in if can I get a show of hands of who the Chinese Australians um, in the room if you were racially um, yeah, threatened or attacked anyone out of curiosity okay oh, there's a few there yeah okay that's interesting um, and also, you're putting them on the spot. Yes, it's, yeah. it's, a, really, it's a really sensitive topic, and is. not everyone is willing to share. No. It's very, um, it's very personal, and I really appreciate um, people who came to the media to to share their stories because those are powerful stories, and that remind us we can do better as a society. Mm. Yeah. So it's obviously still an issue, uh, encouraging though it is to see the trend line decreasing. Um, one of the clearest findings of the survey is also that nine out of 10 Chinese Australians see Australia as a favourable, that's a good or very good uh, place to live, which has increased by 15 points uh, since 2020. Uh, Lucy Du, can I ask you, how do you think uh, the last three years, noting that we've had a global pandemic and COVID lockdowns in China, in Australia, and then easing at various times, how has that affected um, perceptions of how Chinese Australians might have seen Australia as a place to live. Mm. Um, so I came back to Australia at the start of 2020. So I missed the China lockdowns, but I was part of the Melbourne lockdowns, both the Melbourne lockdowns. <laughs> <laughs> so you can feel sorry for me. Uh, but having just returned from Shanghai um, yesterday, I spoke with a lot of um, my friends, my former colleagues, both Chinese and expats on their lived experiences. I'm sure we've heard a lot in the news. I'm sure many of you do have friends um, and acquaintances in Shanghai who you spoke to. And it was, you know, very confronting to hear, I guess, firsthand for me. Um, and that really put into context the findings that, you know, the majority of Chinese Australians do see Australia as favourable you know, some examples of what, you know, my friends told me about, you know, what happened in Shanghai, inconsistencies in getting food from the authorities, legitimately, you know, starving. This is not, you know, um, you know, a lie, but at the same time, others who had an overabundance of food being provided by their local authorities, including abalone and beer. So not everyone is necessarily treated equal. 
Um, there's, you know, a lot of uh, disparities in terms of how social distancing um, is implemented. I had a story of a friend who said, you know, in their compound there were a lot of cases and it, they found out it was because the elderly, um, you know, kind of people, residents in their neighbourhood had been getting up in the morning at 5 a.m. before the kind of neighbourhood watch committee were doing their patrols and having a chat and mingling and not social distancing and as a result spreading COVID. Um, and, you know, kind of, you know, things that I'm sure you all know about changing policies with how close contacts are treated. So I think a lot of those stories that many Chinese Australians hear, hear and know from their friends and family has as a result reflected, you know, on what the lockdowns were like in Australia, which, you know, in Melbourne it was hard, but it was nowhere as comparable to, I think, a lot of the experiences that people um, in China had. Yeah. Mm. So it's obviously a hard time to be living in China during those restrictions. Um, but Jennifer, is there an issue in terms of timing here and when the poll was taken and the, the, the sequencing of when restrictions were lifted in, in uh, China vis-a-vis -vis Australia? Yeah, so the poll, um, as Ryan mentioned uh, at the beginning, was in field between September to December last year. And so around that time, you know, uh, in April last year, um, you might have seen the Voices of Shanghai or Voices of Spring, that video that was, um, uh, you know, replayed millions of times. You hear the distress of Shanghainese living under lockdown and then subsequently there are other lockdowns that Chinese cities went through and then uh, at the end of October last year in November there was um, protests and discontent um, in in major cities across China um, starting off uh, in, in Xinjiang and so and those were discontent and protests about uh, the, the state of lockdown people were getting frustrated people were getting tired being locked up for weeks on end and so all that all that filtered through the international media and you know those are the things that we read last year about China so I think if, if you read both English and Chinese you would have been exposed to these stories and at, at the time of field work you know there were discontent there were protests happening in China so I think the context of what was happening in China at that time gives some understanding to 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 these sentiments that you see um, in, in the report about sense of belonging and pride, um, uh, seeing Australia as a favourable place to live. Moving to media and information consumption habits, uh, when it comes to social media, uh, YouTube, then Facebook, then WeChat are the most popular social media platforms for respondents to this survey. Most uh, Chinese Australians uh, get their Chinese and English language news from WeChat, although that is declining in number. Um, but around half doubt its fairness or and, and accuracy. Um, Samuel Young, as a as a media professional, could I ask what what does this tell you about how Chinese Australians interpret the world, um, and what is the significance of those platforms? Um, I guess there is. A there is an important context of this, which is who we've surveyed. And I think Jennifer mentioned previously to me that we have people from with Australian citizenship or people from temporary visas, or that includes um, tourists or, uh, sorry, uh, international students. So um, a lot of migrants coming from China, they have, they have this habit of using WeChat and Lucy. <laughs> Um, can absolutely agree with that, and you can tell tell us more about that. Um, but um, um, a lot of people, um, a lot of migrants, Chinese, especially Chinese migrants, they are conditioned to use um, um, to use WeChat as the primary source of information, and it has a huge impact on how they perceive the world and how they understand the world. Um, I think um, in this in Australia, there is a vacuum of um, of Chinese language um, content, and although we know we know SBS and the ABC both have digital Chinese um, language content platforms, but that's not enough for um, new migrants or existing migrants to 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 get their information from. 
Um, I think there is room for improvements in Australia to provide a better platform for Chinese language speak Chinese speakers um, who are relying on Chinese content to get the information, especially, for example, in the past two, two years, the public health information or information um, about uh, uh, both the, the political conflicts or um, uh, other trade matters. Um, I think there is a huge, it's, it tells us that there is a huge gap in the, in how Australians, Australian media outlets and um, provide in terms of the information, in terms of the content. And also um, that um, I would say it's, it's a largely untapped market or audience that we need to serve, serve especially for the national broadcasters and also for even for commercial chat for commercial channels outlets um, there are lots of stories in in the community and a lot, a lot of um, interesting talent to interview and and also it's it's healthy that we see them on our television and programs on TV screens or on our daily newspapers because um, it's a reflex the makeup of our society and now we have 1.4 million Australians are living here with Chinese heritage and that's very important that we also reflect that in our uh, daily conversation in our news reporting and I'm so um, glad to see that a lot of media outlets these days they hire people with that kind of with Chinese background when it comes to covering China or when it comes to covering the bilateral relationship between the two countries or cultural issues and social affairs issues because they bring the expertise, they bring the lived experience, the nuance into our coverage. And of course, you're a testament to that. Um, when it comes to confidence in Australia, in the Australian media and how it reports on China, uh, this has improved over time, but there's still a divide between those who see it as too negative um, versus those who see it as fair and balanced. Uh, Lucy, uh, there's... In terms of the confidence improving, how do you view Australian media coverage on China? And does it make sense to you that there's this trend line of increasing confidence in, in Australian media reporting? Yeah, before I get to that, I just want to comment on what uh, Sam said. Um, his reference was us in the back and me saying that um, after living in, in Shanghai for six years, I got put off using YouTube and Facebook. I, I have no interest in using it anymore because I didn't have access to it. And now, you know, I'm all on Instagram and, and WeChat. And the WeChat ecosystem is incredible, right? So for not just news, but for business, everything is in that ecosystem, which is why it's not a surprising result that everyone is reading, you know, news and sharing news because it's the biggest platform you can do everything on it, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, and, you know, WeChat has huge teams that, you know, help create mini programs, work with global clients to basically keep everybody, like how, you know, LinkedIn wants you to keep using LinkedIn, right? So, you know, that's why I think it's a hugely untapped market. And for both Australian broadcasters, government, um, commercial businesses, it's really important to understand how to best use it um, to you know, reach a much larger untapped market in Australia. Yeah, I think the number I saw recently, that's 690,000 daily users in Australia. So that's mm. a huge audience mm. um, that we need to capture. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. And, and on your question about Australian media coverage, uh, I haven't been in Australia for the last two weeks, so I haven't had a lot of access to Australian news. So this morning I actually went and purchased a copy of the newspaper, which by the way is really expensive. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while since I, I purchased a, a paper. And uh, this is the, the Daily Tally, so you know, take everything with a grain of salt. But in their world section, they had you know the headline, Chinese secret police, Chinese secret police station harassing US dissidents which you know, I think often you see in not just um, you know, the Daily Telegraph, but I find you know, often when the media uses Chinese instead of China's secret police, 
it does conflate the association of being Chinese from a heritage perspective, from a family perspective, to being linked with the CCP or you know anything that's government related, and that you know does detract previously, maybe less so now, um, as people have a much better understanding of you know the differences of feeling like you can identify being with Chinese because you know that's just your genetics rather than which um, political party you, you know, adhere to. Mm. Mm. And I think one of the things this, uh, this report does is it shows the diversity of views in the Chinese Australian community. Of course, um, there's, it's, not, uh, that, uh, it's not synonymous with uh, the CCP and the Chinese people. They're, they're um, separate things and different viewpoints on, on a range of issues. Do you have something else? Yeah, I um, just want to say I think that's a really important um, point that Lucy mentioned because um, often I see that um, a lot of Australian coverage on China is way too simplistic so we need to um, there is a nuance between the state the party state China Chinese and um, Chinese Australian or the CCP so um, I think there there's definitely room to improve that's why I think nuanced approach when it comes to China coverage is so important, especially in, um, in the context, context of that we are more and more intertwined as, as nations, as people, and, um, it's, and also with the change of the government, I think, I think that, that kind of conversation is def definitely much needed. Mm. And I would um, also just say that the statistic you brought up, Ryan, that um, so this year what we found was um, Chinese Australians are evenly split between um, believing Australian media reporting about China is too negative, four out, of, four out of 10 Chinese Australians think it's too negative, and the other four out of 10 think it's fair and balanced. And so I think, um, so you might scratch your head and go, what well, shouldn't the split be between too negative and too, too positive? But it is what it is. But I think it does tell us that there is a diversity of opinions about how we view China, even within the Chinese Australian communities, mm. right? Mm -hmm. There are a variety of perspectives. So if you're from Hong Kong, you might see China in a very different light compared to someone having been born and lived in China for most of their lives and then come here as a as a student or as a worker. So I think, you know, I think the 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 statistics does give you sort of a flavor of the of the diversity within within the community. Could I just stay with you, Jennifer, on the issue of uh, misinformation? We've seen this become um, quite prominent in recent years, and your survey uh, looked at how uh, Chinese Australians recognise and identify misinformation. Um, could you speak to the, the finding there and, and uh, what are Chinese Australians uh, becoming more aware of the risks of misinformation? Yeah, so this year, um you know, roughly two thirds of Chinese Australians um, are confident or somewhat confident in identifying made up news or um, fake news. You can take that with a grain of salt, it's self-reporting. Um, but I think that's, you know, that's, that's a good number. But at the same time, you have to think, you know, what, what about the other third um, who, are, who aren't confident um, what are we doing in that space and trying to build their resilience uh, in, you know, weathering sort of misinformation that might come their way through a variety of um, platforms, not just WeChat, but it could be YouTube, um, WhatsApp, um, Facebook, etc. cetera. Uh, Sam, do you want to add anything else on that as a producer of news yourself? Um, in terms of the... In terms of uh, misinformation and uh, awareness perceptions of, of that, um, I think the um, um, a lot of uh, misinformation or disinformation can come from social media, mm. and especially if we have a, such a huge number of audience um, consuming platforms like WeChat, which is a highly censored platform, and um, and also full of misinformation mm. um, at times. And um, so I, I think that's, um, uh, that can definitely contribute to how people understand um, the world and how people perceive the, um, the, the, daily, the daily topics that we 
that we have um, uh, when it comes to this information or this information. That's a good segue to the next uh, major theme of this report, which is how Chinese, the Chinese Australian community perceive world affairs. Now, there's a striking gap in perceptions, threat perceptions between that of the Australian Chinese community and that of the broader Australian community. Uh, a few findings I think are worth um, stating here uh, to illustrate that. The, the clear majority of Chinese Australians say that they trust China to act responsibly in the world compared to only 12% of the broader Australian population who say the same. 42% of that community had, uh, the Chinese Australian community had faith in President Xi Jinping to do the right thing in world affairs. That's declining, but it's still four times higher than the broader population. And a clear majority see China as an economic partner rather than a security threat, which is the other way around when we polled the broader Australian population. Um, so that speaks to a, um, certainly a lower level of threat perception amongst the Chinese Australian community uh, uh, when it comes to China. Um, Jennifer, how do you explain that gap between the, the, the two, uh, the, yeah. that segment and the broader community? Yeah, so on a number of these questions related to geopolitics, world affairs, there is that significant gap between the Chinese Australian population and that of the broader Australian population, whether it is about you know, how we see China, whether it's an economic partner or a security threat, or Russia-Ukraine war, concern about opening up a, China potentially opening up a military base in the Pacific. Um, there's just generally lower threat perception levels amongst Chinese Australian communities. And I think um, we can start off by thinking, you know, this figure, 45% of Chinese Australians were born in China. So they have a very intimate engagement um, interaction with China, whether that is being born in China or whether they have family, friends um, live, living in China or um, still in China. So th that's one way of sort of contextualising that, um, that result. But also um, it, it is likely that many Chinese Australians have um, bilingual capabilities, or if not trilingual. So being able to speak Mandarin, um, understand Chinese, allows you to engage with um, different media um, to, uh, media outlets, not just in English, but also in Chinese. So if you're able to consume news and hear news in a different language, it also gives you a different perspective on world affairs. So, uh, and I think that, I think that may explain sort of the, the gap between the broader Australian population and Chinese Australian population is that perhaps the broader Australian population, their consumption of news related to China is per perhaps in English, whereas for Chinese Australians, um, it could be English, Chinese, um, and if they speak a third language, maybe another th third language. But I think sort of those those um, demographics give you some indication as to why there might be that um, difference between the two population groups. Sam, mm -hmm. can I ask you to come in on the uh, media consumption point? I mean, how does that influence the uh, perceptions of threat levels? Uh, and, and views of the world? I think um, Australian media coverage on China is largely focused on the geopolitical or bilateral tensions um, and the trade wars between the two countries and um, foreign interference in, China, um, in Australia from um, whether from, from the government or from the government agent, agents here in Australia, those are very important and um, issues that we definitely need to, to cover and to report on those uh, matters uh, to inform the Australian audiences or the public. But at the same time, I think I have seen little media coverage on China as a nation and its people and culture. I think that's very important to also bring that into the dialogue, bring that into our understanding about China as, as a country, as our largest trading partner, and as this um, superpower in our region in the Asia Pacific. So I've, I've, I think what, what I do at, with the ABC with China tonight is to bring that kind of um, human aspect into the conversation, to the public eyes, so we understand and important issues, also important issues in China, 
And especially given that we don't, we don't have the access to, to China um, from Australian media outlets, so we don't have that kind of first account um, uh, perspective or, uh, or uh, first-hand reporting. Uh, for the Australian public to understand this country and um, the, the ins and outs of the society or the government or the party. Um, I think that's also very, very important to, uh, to improve our uh, capability in understanding China. Can I also just add, um, you know, for us here in Australia, everything is, pretty much everything is China adjacent, right? Um, when we read world news, China is always the top of the headlines. And um, Lucy might speak to this, being that you were in Shanghai recently, that um, while everything might be China adjacent for us, it's not necessarily the other way around. No one cares about Australia. <laughs> that's probably the bottom line in China. No, that's <laughs> off record. Um, yeah. yeah, so, so, I, I so the, the concern for, for Chinese in China is not necessarily Australia, but the US, right? Absolutely. And so if we read here in Australia every day about China, there is that we're going to absorb that mm. and internalize it. Whereas I don't think, you know, for, for China it's, or Chinese people are seen as, as a... Yeah, I think going back to your comment about, you know, being able to have multiple sources, you know, in Chinese language as well, you kind of realize that the reporting that Australia does related to China in reverse, I don't think it's proportionate. I don't think China reports equally um, as much um, about Australia. And I think, you know, going to your point, Sam, there should be more stories about, you know, the economic partnership, which is there. I think, you know, people don't write about it because maybe it doesn't sell the newspapers as much um, or people don't like to talk about it because they don't want it to impact on business. They just want to do it, you know, because of the kind of, issues with, you know, being associated with the bilateral tensions, um, but being able to tell those stories um, through multiple channels, um, including in Australian media, I think is really important. Uh, so touched on the issue there of uh, the, the sources of information that get consumed and perhaps different focuses depending on which channels you're accessing. Um, Jennifer, is there also an age uh, differential here when it comes to um, threat perceptions, particularly with China? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the, for Chinese Australians who are sort of younger, 18 to, say, 44, if that's young, um, then, then um, so be it. Um, I think there's just... Uh, and those, are, those people in that age category are here um, having perhaps studied here as an international student and then stayed on um, as worker or here um, uh, as well, on a working visa. So I think that that age group generally with sort of strong connection to China will tend to have lower threat perception levels of, of China just because of their immediacy to, to China, to their family in China, to friends in China. Yeah. And also having gone through the education system in China um, you know, that it does shape one's thinking in, in, and worldview in a certain way. Mm. Now, we focus a lot on the uh, gap in the uh, threat perceptions, but also there's, uh, the report goes into a bit of detail about uh, the, the, the perception of democracy and whether that's preferable to any other form of government. Um, Australia uh, is also seen as the most trusted country um, out of those polls, more so than China. And Anthony Albanese is seen as the most trusted leader um, globally. So uh, there's, there's a few interesting things that we haven't had the time to touch on. Maybe it's something that um, people want to throw questions to the panel about. We've got a, about um, 20 or so minutes. I'm sure there are lots of questions. I know we have uh, media in the room as well, and you might want to address some of the points made by the panel here. Um, can I ask when you uh, to firstly wait for the microphone, um, identify your, yourself and your affiliation, and please keep it to one brief question. Um, please raise your hands if you if you have a question. Peter Harcher. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> Thanks to the panel. Very interesting discussion. Peter Harcher from the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, 
Your very last point, Ryan, about the level of trust in Anthony Albanese, the Albanese government, which is obviously a lot, lot higher among the Chinese Australian community than it was in the Morrison government. I wonder how much of that is bound up in the person of Penny Wong. I wonder whether uh, any of the improvement in sense of belonging, sense of trust in the Chinese Australian community is related to seeing the most senior political office holder, female office holder in the country as a, well, not Chinese Australian, she, she identifies as Malaysian Chinese Australian. Um, how much of it is, is, is related to her? Do you have a view on that, please? I should point out when we, we've been using the term Chinese Australian as shorthand for a variety of different ways people characterise themselves through this survey. But Jennifer, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I can't answer specifically about whether Penny Wong has had an impact, but I will draw upon our focus groups discussions in that um, people have said, you know, the change in government uh, has led to a change in language and tone. And for that, um, you know, a lot of the focus group discussions uh, with Chinese Australians with different identities um, see that as important. Um, they welcome that change. It may not necessarily lead to policy shifts, but I think that language and tone matters and it then filters through to other aspects of one's daily life, your experience, you know, with racism or declining experience with racism. So, um, you know, people do do note um, people who are culturally and linguistically different in positions of power, and that has come up in discussions. Yes, Lucy, do yeah, I I think so. I agree with you um, personally. Um, I think you know having someone at least for the Chinese Australian community that they see as being similar in, and represents them right in Australia. Um, that's quite important. And of course, you know, the comparison, you know, the contrast between the previous government to, you know, the current government has changed the tone significantly. Um, but I definitely would agree with that comment. Sam, do you think language and tone have, have moved the needle on this? Oh, definitely. Um, especially from the, the business community in Australia who, who do business uh, or trade with China from here in Australia or in Sydney or Melbourne, the people I've spoken to. Um, in, in wine business or in other parts of their business sector, um, they, di they did welcome the, the change in government and they did uh, s seem to be more hopeful for the, for the trade relationship with China. Uh, the gentleman just there. Hello, uh, Peter Hannum uh, from uh, The Guardian. Um, I just wondered, given uh, if there's about 45% of the population of uh, Chinese Australians being born in uh, mainland China, or China, I suppose that includes Hong Kong these days, with the data you have, were you able to kind of cross-reference, for example, people who got their information from line in Taiwan or, or answered with complicated characters? Uh, did that, did you, were you able to kind of identify perhaps, you know, who was a mainlander, a Southeast Asian origin, or Hong Kong, Taiwan, and therefore what were their kind of responses to like, for instance, supporting China or the US in the case of military conflict? Yeah, I mean, yes, we can pick apart that, um, that data, but, but I can't tell you specifically about conflict uh, based on sort of uh, off the top of my head. But I will say um, this is one thing that I was looking into is that um, those born in Hong Kong are more frequent users of YouTube than those born in mainland China. Um, you know, 76% of those born in China are frequent daily users of WeChat compared to, say, other um, people with Chinese heritage born in Hong Kong. So, yes, we do have that data and I'm happy to discuss uh, more in depth um, after I've, sorry, can I jump in? <laughs> yeah, please. I think Peter raised a, a really important context in this conversation is that the Chinese Australian and community is not monolithic. It's so diverse. People speak so many different languages and coming from different parts of the world with different regions or uh, country, countries of birth. Um, and that's absolutely very, very important uh, for us to understand that uh, different if you 
people might have different views. If you're from mainland China, you're from Taiwan, you're from uh, Southeast Asia, Thai, um, Thailand, or uh, Myanmar, there's so many different, and the way, uh, when it comes to traditions, um, how they celebrate their cultures are different, and uh, they have, of course, they have different views on the, the, the Chinese government or, the China, or China as a nation. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a very important context. Is there a question down the front here? Michaela? Uh, Michaela Louie from the Lowy Institute. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, growing up as a second generation Chinese Australian, um, the topic of racism and indeed identity was never really discussed in my household or even really anywhere else. Um, how do you think this survey contributes to that discussion and who's participating in it? And what other factors do you think um, contribute to that um, topic in Australia today? Lisa, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, I think it's interesting. I'm curious to know how many second gen Australians. I'm often torn personally between if I'm first gen or second gen. I think there's a new term called 1.5 gen, which is perfect. <laughs> um, I think often, you know, that sense of belonging and where you identify um, is just quite complicated. And hopefully, you know, some of the report draws out, you know, a, much more diverse um, range of viewpoints from the broader Chinese Australian community that helps the second gen, I guess, find some alignment and find some similarities in terms of how they feel towards certain issues um, and how they can connect. Yeah, I'm, I think I identify as a 1.5 gen. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, sort of on a personal note, issues of discrimination and racism was never talked about while we were growing up. Uh, and it was only until uh, my brother and I became sort of adults, you know, over dinner that we heard about my parents' experiences with racism. I think as a, t as a, as a parent, there's a tendency to want to shield your children, um, to cocoon them from this experience, which is fine. But I think uh, on the other hand, there, there is a need for the broader public to acknowledge that these um, incidences do happen. But when it comes to sort of um, the survey and um, sort of thinking just a little bit beyond the question is that there are gaps between how Chinese Australians view the world and that of the Australian population, which I think is fine. And, you know, a conversation with a colleague here reminded me that it's not necessarily about closing the gap. It's about acknowledging the difference and how can we use that difference to inform policy making. Did you want to add something? Any other questions? Uh, Hi, yeah. thanks. Uh, my name is Christina Ho. I'm from the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, I wanted to look at the question of the reliance on WeChat by a lot of the Chinese Australians in your study. And I think um, someone mentioned that there is a sense of um, distrust, um, that people are aware that there is misinformation, uh, although there is such heavy reliance on WeChat. So I'm wondering, maybe in the focus groups, if it ever came up, did you set, get a sense that any Chinese Australians have any strategies for critically evaluating what they're seeing on WeChat, um, or how do they make sense of that, you know, sort of sense of uh, mis untrustworthiness, um, but yet so being so reliant on WeChat? Yeah, I think um, sometimes in the broader conversation about WeChat, TikTok, um, and other social media platforms that are, you know, under the spotlight, we underestimate users' ability to triangulate their information. And this is something that came up in the focus groups. People are wary, but it is an important source of information for lifestyle information, for shopping, for getting the latest deals at Aldi, finding out about the latest deals from Aldi, Woolworths, Coles, etc. This is an important part of the WeChat ecosystem, but it doesn't mean that they don't triangulate that information that they get when it comes to sort of news news items. People do um, 
the longer they uh, have lived in Australia, um, the more likely they're going to exit and use other platforms to get their news and information. So I think people do have a variety of strategies to triangulate that information that they get. They read in Chinese, they read in English, they use um, Channel 9 News, um, but they also read ABC News. Um, and those working in the ABC will, will be glad to know that ABC and SBS are, you know, highly trusted platforms, but there was also some doubt. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, people do, we underestimate users' ability to try and get like, their information, even though they might be frequent users of WeChat. I think on that, I can't see you. Oh, there you are. Um, in the same way that in Australia, we kind of have a sense, right, of what each of the news outlets and their kind of tone and their bias, I, I feel like um, for Chinese language or Chinese Australians, and, and this is, you know, kind of chatting to a friend who lives in, in Shenzhen, you know, the Chinese, and I'm sure it's similar to a lot of the, the survey respondents, they spend years curating their news sources, right? You read a news article, you realise it's fake, you make a note that you don't follow the account anymore, that it's, you know, somewhat suspicious. And, you know, you kind of build up this, um, you know, robust repository that you create amongst your, you know, your friends. I think that's, you know, exactly how that strategy comes about. I'm not sure, but it takes, from what I understand, um, a lot of time because there's a lot more diversity in news sources um, in China and in, in Chinese language news sources. And again, you know, with WeChat, anyone can write a WeChat article, post it on a WeChat account and say it's an official something. Um, and I think it's a, an important point that we don't conflate uh, frequency of use with reliance on. So uh, the, it, it, the findings look at the uh, amount that these platforms are used and um, they do use multiple platforms. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Uh, gentlemen over here. Just wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. Simon Chen, President of Chinese Australian Forum. Um, it's a very interesting survey you did, Jennifer, so you should be congratulated on that. Um, I'm just curious to find out from all the results that you get from the survey, what conclusion or outcome can you draw from that in terms of advocacy for Chinese Australian? Advocacy? Is that... Yeah. Um... I'd say, I mean, definitely I'm feeling an undercurrent of um, not just Chinese Australians, but the broader Asian Australian population being wanting to be heard and with the last federal election, greater representation of Asian Australian parliamentarians was really important um, for a lot of um, people within my circle. So I think... Um, I'm hoping that, you know, the survey adds data points to greater national security and foreign policy debates, you know, thinking through that there are a variety of sentiments and uh, perspectives here um, and that they should be acknowledged and perhaps accounted for. But at the same time, sort of on the more community social level, um, perhaps the survey may allow um, those in the communities to start engaging, to start thinking through how could these data points uh, assist us in greater advocacy, whether it be, you know, local election, uh, standing for local councillor, um, greater representation in the um, institutions which um, uh, shape our lives. Yeah. Gentleman down the front here. Hi, Chesney from the College of Surgeons. Great work, Jennifer, by the way. So. <laughs> um, when I'm working at the college, we wanted to um, identify diversity within our fellowship. But one of the problems that we have is that we don't want to homogenize particular groups. So from your experience with your survey, was there an expression of diversity and the risk of homogenizing the Chinese identity? Because there's many different types of Chinese people. <laughs> you know, Singaporean, Taiwanese, mainland, Hong Kong, and politically they don't all see eye to eye or even socially economically. But one of the biggest problems we have with the media, sorry, journalists, 
is that they sometimes homogenize the Chinese identity, which can contribute to discrimination. Um, yes. So, um, so if you engage with the report and see the interactive, we do demographic breakdowns to show you that there is a diversity, not just in um, where you were born, but in age, um, your political preferences, your um, uh, level of education, those all contribute to one's identity and a community's identity. But um, I, I totally share that, the, you know, the, our use here of Chinese Australians is simply a, um, for better or for worse, is a shorthand to capture, um, you know, what Ryan mentioned. Those um, people may identify Australian Chinese rather than Chinese Australian. They might identify Australian or Chinese or none of the above, right? Or like me, where, where do I put Chinese, Taiwanese, Australian, Sydney cider? So, yeah, uh, uh, yes, identity is complicated and this is not often something not picked up by, by media in the reporting of communities related to, to Chinese Australians. Time for one more question. Uh, lady down the front here. Thank you. Um, I'm Sophie Liu. I'm a director with the Rhodium Group. Um, as a Chinese American <laughs> living in Australia, one aspect of your report that really struck me was the incredible differentiation and difference um, in the opinions of the general um, Aussie population around America versus the Chinese Aussie population about America. So I'm going to bring up kind of the thousand pound pink elephant in the room in the sense that um, one thing that struck me in my years living here is the amount of influence that America has in Australia. Um, and so I guess what I'm kind of curious is, driven by the winds <laughs> of the prevailing um, relationship between the US and China, which is kind of the dominant relationship between those two countries. If we were saying before that maybe Chinese media doesn't spend much time covering Australia, but I'm sure that it spent a lot of time covering America. Um, so in, in this kind of like, you know, being buffeted around by these larger forces at play, how do Chinese Aussies propose to carve out a path uh, for themselves? And then how does Australia uh, propose to carve its path, uh, you know, in terms of its relationship to to China. I'm curious to hear, like, if there were any learnings from the study or, you know, any just opinions from the panelists on, on that issue. Jennifer? Who <laughs> <laughs> wants to wrestle with the thousand pound That's what, uh, that's what <laughs> I do. Um, I think just from a very kind of grassroots level, it's just for more Australians to get a better understanding of Chi being Chinese, China, you know, the multiple identities of being Chinese Australian, you know, covering from Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, and then even within China as well. I mean, I'm sure you would know that, you know, between Beijing and Shanghai, there's a lot of differences and then you go down south. So, you know, from my perspective and what we want to do with, you know, ACYPI is to build that connection between individuals to learn from each other um, and to foster that understanding um, at the people level and hopefully <laughs> and I think that's a great starting point um, in terms of building out a much more rounded understanding of how Australia can position ourselves in the context of China and the US and you know the economic partnership is really important I think often very much understated and um, underreported and you know celebrated really um, in Australia, which I hope we can do more of. Sam, did you want to come in on that? Oh, I think I think at a um, uh, grassroots relation, uh, exchange or fellowship between the two countries that's so important, and uh, especially we haven't seen that happening for a while or less. Yeah, uh, less it's been hard. Yeah, it's been hard. We all know why, but um, I think uh, hopefully I will see more that kind of exchange or dialogue happening between the two countries. And Jennifer, can I? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm less optimistic. I think there are insoluble differences, um, given that uh, Australia has relied so much on on China's development for Australia's prosperity, but now we're seeing sort of greater. Um, uh, 
engagement and uh, tethering of Australia's national security and defense interests with the US. Um, and as the, as the two powers rival each other, it leaves Australia in a, in a difficult position and it's, it's not one that is going to be easily solved. And can you have your cake and eat it too is the, is the question. I, I, for, for Chinese Australians, I think it, um, there's a real practical perspective and that is to see the trade side of it, to see the economic partnership, um, whether that means um, at the expense of other things, I, I'm not sure. But I think there, the larger picture is one of complexity and requires policymakers to think about these issues. But um, yeah, I think there are great differences that are really hard to resolve at this point in time. There's a big question is there, we've covered a lot of ground this evening. Uh, if you would like to, and I would encourage you to delve into the, the findings in a bit more detail, as Jennifer mentioned, you can actually look at historical data over the life of this uh, survey's existence, as well as um, different variables and demographics, and you can, you can explore how that affects different responses. Uh, that's all online on the Lowe Institute website. Um, we, uh, you're welcome to join us here for a, a drink after this. Um, but for now, I'd like to again congratulate Jennifer Su on, um, on the third iteration of the Being Chinese in Australia report. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating piece of research and obviously will, has stoked a lot of debate and will continue to be debating those points um, over, over the years. Uh, also, thank you to Samuel Yang and Lucy Du for your contributions on the panel and to the audience here for your, uh, for your questions and your interests. Um, I'll also acknowledge the Department of Home Affairs, which uh, contributed to funding um, this research. And uh, I, uh, once again, thank you to everybody, and we look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you, and thank you Ryan.